as Steve mentioned, I've been with Morningstar since 2010, so I've been, uh, been with, uh, around for a lot of those years. Uh, we've been able to partner on, on many different things over the years, but I'm very thankful for the business that we've been able to do together, and, and I'm also most thankful for the work that Steve and his team has been able to do for all of you over the years. Clearly, you have a lot of confidence in everything that Brophy Wealth Management does for you, and I will say, in my role, being the Morningstar representative for New England, I travel all around New England, meeting with financial advisors and helping them to understand our firm and our portfolios and consulting with them on how to use our portfolios with their clients. And I can truly say that Broadway Wealth Management is one of the best investment advisory firms, not only in the Manchester area, but really in the entire region as a whole. They do a fantastic job. Steve, James, Luke, they are fantastic financial advisors and you should be very happy about everything that they're doing with you. Uh, I also wanna say thank you to Sarah and Maureen for putting this event on, they did a fantastic job. And thank you again for inviting us to participate as well. So as I mentioned, I've been with Morningstar since 2010. I'm based in Andover, Mass, so I'm just down the road. Uh, and uh, I wanted to say a couple words about Morningstar before I bring in Marta. Uh, as many of you may know, you've probably seen me at a few of these events over the years. We've been able to do a couple of these things over, over the past decade or so. Morningstar is a company that was founded in the, in the early 1980s, primarily as a mutual fund research company. If you rewind back to the early 1980s, you may remember that uh, it was the beginning of something called the 401k, right? Uh, at the, uh, the end of pensions, in the advent of the 401k, we were all required to start investing our own money and planning for our own retirements. And so we started this business, our founder, Joe Mansueto in Chicago, founded this business based on the idea that we could help investors achieve better outcomes with their money through the use of our research. And at the time, that was strictly mutual funds. We have branched out over the years to provide ratings on all types of securities so that today, Morningstar is the industry leader when it comes to independent and unbiased securities research. And throughout that entire time period, we have maintained one singular goal, and that's been to help people make more informed decisions about what to do with their investments. And so if you're an individual investor or a financial advisor, you can use our research to help you pick funds or stocks or ETFs. If you're a financial advisor, you can also use our investment portfolios as well. And our platform, where we offer a wide variety of different portfolios, represents a way of tapping into our expertise in everything that we do from a research standpoint to build portfolios where you can be confident that we're going to do a good job by setting the asset allocation or the mix of investments that you have. And you can also be confident that we're going to be selecting for you a great selection of individual investments. Obviously, nobody's perfect. I'm sure that you're not expecting us to be perfect, but you can be confident that, that we are going to do a good job of selecting a portfolio that's been chosen for you by your financial advisors that's designed to reach your investment goals, where you can, again, be confident that that portfolio, no matter what's happening with the markets, is gonna help you reach whatever objectives that you have. So thank you for your business. Thank you for your confidence. We appreciate that very much. Uh, I'm really excited to have Marta Norton with us here tonight. She is here from Chicago, so she actually flew here to meet with us. I just drove up from Andover, Mass, so it was easy for me, but Marta actually came from Chicago, so thank you, Marta, very much for, for being here. Uh, I mentioned I've been at Morningstar since 2010. Marta's been at Morningstar since 2005, yep. so even longer than I have. We've been able to work for, with each other for many years. Marta does a fantastic job of being a steward of our investment team and our portfolios. So uh, she's had a, a number of roles with Morningstar over the years, starting out as just an, an analyst, right? Uh, to being a manager of individual portfolios, to now being the CIO, the Chief Investment Officer of the Americas for Morningstar Investment Management. So she leads our investment team. She sits on our investment asset allocation policy team. She manages all the people that manage our portfolios. And so she is obviously incredibly involved with all of our investment strategies. And we're very lucky to have here have her here tonight to talk a little bit about some ideas about what's going on with the market. So Marta's gonna talk briefly about Morningstar, our investment philosophy and our process. 
And then I think we're going to try to keep it a little bit uh, open-ended. We're really excited to hear questions from all of you. I'm sure Steve is going to talk a lot as well as he usually does. Um, and hopefully we can keep it open-ended from there. But uh, I do want to bring up Martin now. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you all. Thanks, Brad. Brad down, ran down the thank yous to everyone in the crowd, to Steve and team. Um, but I also want to thank you all for coming out because ultimately what we're doing at Morningstar, whether it's part of the managed portfolios or whether it's on the research team, is thinking about the individual investors who sit on the other side of the investment and making sure that we're putting together solutions that make sense for you, that we're delivering research that helps you make better decisions. That's key to who we are, it's part of who Morningstar's brand is, and it's why many of us are so passionate about working at Morningstar. So thank you so much for, for coming out. You guys are the motivation um, behind what we do. Brad gave you a sense of the history for Morningstar, founded in the 1980s with this aim of helping individual investors sort among mutual funds, which were very new at the time, knowing what was a good fund, what was a bad fund, how do you make decisions that are going to you know, get, deliver to you the investment objectives that you have. Um, and Morningstar, since the 1980s, has branched out to these other areas. So we continue to have a mutual fund research team that's continuing to sort between good and bad mutual funds. We have an ETF team as ETFs became um, more and more popular. In fact, that's what I was hired to be in 2005 when I joined the firm was an ETF analyst helping to understand these new strategies. We have our equity research team, which Steve referenced, which is how, uh, understanding what the prospects are for these individual companies on a going forward basis. Um, and we have credit ratings, we have data, we're building out this entire kind of infrastructure of investment knowledge. And actually what's interesting is that this business, this managed portfolio business that you're using as, as your options for your portfolios, was actually founded out of advisor demands. So a group of ad financial advisors approached Joman Suedo around 2001, saying you have all this great data, you have all this great research, why don't you put together portfolios that we can use for our clients. And as you know, financial advisors are jacks of all trades. They're, they're um, focused on the financial planning element, which is so critical to helping you achieve the goals that you have on an individual basis. They're also managing the relationship with you, helping you understand what's going on in the markets. Um, and they're focused on kind of the tax element and all these different areas. So it's hard to you know, do the investment piece alongside all of those other areas. And so that's where Morningstar comes in to create these portfolios. And having joined, I joined Morningstar in 2005. I switched to the investment team in 2008. And having joined the team in 2008, I've had this opportunity to see our evolution over the years. So when I joined our investment team, we offered a suite of portfolios, many of the portfolios that are around today. We offered individual equities, portfolios of individual stocks. We offered um, asset allocation portfolios that were populated with mutual funds across fixed income, across equities to give a diversified portfolio. And over time, we've added additional portfolios of various varieties. So ETF portfolios that are still equities and bonds, but using ETFs to get that exposure. So a whole range of different strategies over the, over the years. And I think one thing that's true about our team is how much we've evolved over the years. There's a few things that haven't changed. We're very Morningstar in our nature. We're very individual investor focused. We're very um, uh, intent on focusing on the very long run. So not managing a portfolio on a day-to-day -day basis and looking at the you know, newspaper headlines and adjusting the portfolio in a hurry, but instead focusing on five and 10 year periods of time and asking ourselves how will investments play out over that period of time. So those characteristics haven't really changed. But what has changed as we've grown up as an asset management shop is our sophistication, our ability to understand the markets. So Morningstar was already well developed in its research and in its data when they launched the Morningstar managed portfolios. But it's very different to be a researcher and to be an investor. When you're a researcher, you put out research and you kind of watch how it plays out, but it, it doesn't 
define you as a human being, depending on how things develop. When you're an investor, you very much care how things play out. You're watching the market day in, day out. You're seeing whether your thesis was correct over time. It's a very different ball game. And so we've had the experience since 2001 to develop as investors and build that kind of experience that can really help us understand how markets behave, how the best way um, to position a particular opportunity is, how we think about what the future is gonna look like, um, having some, I guess, humility around the different investment ideas, having conviction in an idea, but allowing for the possibility that things could play out a little differently than we might expect. Um, so when I joined as, or when I moved into the CIO role in 2020, actually, it's kind of funny because I joined the investment team in 2008 when the entire world was falling apart. And then we went under lockdown. I had three tiny kids and I thought, this is a great time to become CIO. So I tend to make big life decisions when life is about as difficult as it can be. So I, I can only wait for the next crisis and see what decision I'm gonna make. Um, but as, as I moved into the CIO role, I had, a few years as a portfolio manager. I'd been a researcher, I'd been a portfolio manager, and I was able to think about what can we do to continue to improve our process. And what I really zeroed in on is this idea of portfolio construction. So it's one thing to have the research, to have ideas on where the opportunities and risks are in the market. And we can do that across equities. We can do that across asset classes. So asset classes being stocks and bonds, US stocks versus non-US stocks, emerging market stocks, emerging market bonds, all of these different areas. But what really matters is how you bring them together within a portfolio, how you compare how something might do relative to something else, whether these two opportunities that you see actually might be a bet on the same thing. And how do you gauge that? How do you measure that? And so what our focus has been really over the past few years, and I, I shouldn't give myself all the credit because a lot of our team was really wrestling with ideas on this, on this front, but what we've done over the past few years is come together as a, as a committee um, to discuss and weigh these opportunities. So we know what the research is saying, we know where we're excited about in the markets, we know where we're a little bit scared, and now we can come together as a team and say, how do we um, picture what this could look like? And this is called really scenario analysis. That's what the industry term is. So this idea that you can say, okay, imagine interest rates going up 5%, imagine interest rates falling 5%. What happens to this asset class? What happens to that asset class? How do they operate and how do they interact together? And so we've spent increasing amounts of time on this type of an analysis. And it's really helped fortify the investment approach that we have. So it's not entirely research driven. It's also um, kind of thinking about it. If you play poker um, and you know um, Annie Dukes, who is a big poker player, it's kind of thinking in bets thinking about the likelihood that something could happen and the likelihood that it couldn't happen, and then managing a portfolio within that range of probabilities. And so increasingly, that's how we're spending our time, and it's been a really rewarding time. You know, I can't tell you how um, exciting, so-called, it's been since COVID with how the market has moved, how much the economy has moved, and this framework of thinking more about a range of outcomes is really well suited to the environment that we're in, because uncertainty, I always say this, I said this pre-2020, but uncertainty is so high and the future is not preordained and nobody has a crystal ball. So we really have to manage our portfolios for the possibility that any number of things can happen. That doesn't mean that we aim for outperformance in every market. That doesn't mean we aim for positive returns or that our portfolios wouldn't lose money. But what we want to do is put our portfolios in a position so that even if they lose ground, we're able to make up that ground in an appropriate amount of time for the strategy in question. So that conservative strategies are able to, to maybe lose a bit less and make up more ground um, in a shorter period of time. And the more aggressive strategies that maybe lose more are well positioned to zoom ahead and make up for those losses and when you know markets turn. So I know the environment is really maybe tense. Maybe there are some questions on people's minds. And so I'm happy to, to talk about some of those questions. I know we just had a lot of headlines about the debt ceiling. I'm happy to talk about um, what that could mean um, for portfolios. But I wanna use this time in a way that's most useful to you and that kind of addresses the questions that are top of mind for you. So please let me know um, what direction to, to head in. And Steve, Brad, if anything jumps to mind, let me know. 
the out, now that we know what that ceiling compromise is, what, what might that look like as far as economic? And then how does, how does the, you know, the economy and the market are two different things, mm -hmm. right? They, one tends to, to trend with the other, mm -hmm. but they, they are different. So what do, you, what do you see for the economy now that we know we have this little piece in place? Yeah. The, the compromise. Yeah. So the question being, and I'm doing this for the recording, but also in case um, people didn't hear the details there, um, the question around the debt ceiling. What does the debt ceiling compromise mean for the economy, and how might that impact markets? Now, um, this is not going to be the world's most satisfying answer. Um, but what I'll tell you, despite the headlines, despite the noise around the debt ceiling and the debate, and how contentious that is with people having different views on how that should play out, um, that this debt ceiling cycle that we find ourselves in, in our view, is not necessarily fundamental to the health of the markets. So what do I mean by fundamental? What I mean is that it doesn't necessarily impact how markets are going to behave in the long run. It's not one of those um, underlying factors that drives returns. In our view, the debt ceiling is much more of a technical event. What does technical mean? It means it affects maybe sentiment, it affects maybe the way people invest in the short run, but it doesn't necessarily change the underlying structure of the economy. Now, there's no question that spending and investments by the government have an impact on the economy over the long run. And there's different perspectives depending on the economists that you're talking to, whether the spending level in the US is appropriate or not. But as an investor, I'm less concerned about those broad economic questions, and I'm much more concerned about what affects earnings power for companies in the US, what affects the dividends that those companies pay out, what affects the underlying inflation rate for the economy, what affects interest rates for the economy. Those are the kind of variables that our team is looking at on a day-to-day -day basis. So as we're looking at this debt ceiling crisis, and we're looking at the fact that every time we have uncertainty of this magnitude, it causes volatility in the market, what, more, what we are more likely to do is look for what opportunities that could mean for our portfolios. If the debt ceiling, if we were to not reach a compromise in short-term debt, short-term treasuries were to, um, panic a little bit. That might be an opportunity for us to add to short-term treasuries. So we look at these kind of events of this, of this variety to be more of a catalyst for us to adjust our portfolios based on maybe fear in the markets rather than being concerned that something fundamental is shaking the, the, the uh, workings of the overall economy. Is that helpful? Does that answer the question? So many of us here have the stock baskets. Yes. Tortoise hair at the income cap app, things of that nature. Would you consider those strategic, and strategic meaning high conviction when you build them, don't make a lot of changes, or would it be more tactical? Like we look, we look for opportunities or we either the gain or we look for ways to protect ourselves. Yeah. How would you consider the more strategic or more tactical? Yeah, so are the, the, the equity portfolios, the individual equities, the stock baskets, strategic or are they are they tactical? I, I'd say the truth is, is somewhere in between. If I'm an investor and I'm using one of these portfolios, these portfolios fall in a very clear bucket in my mind. I would use them for capital appreciation. These are growth assets. These are for dollars that you're not necessarily going to spend next year or the year after. They're for dollars that you want to grow for 10 years out. And that doesn't change. That's kind of consistent with the nature of how these strategies behave. They're equities and they're actually much more more concentrated, meaning they own fewer stocks than what your typical portfolio would have. A lot of portfolios that you might see in the equity um, arena could own hundreds of stocks. If you buy an index fund, it owns you know, all the stocks that represent a certain market, all the U.S. stocks, or you know, a representative selection of all the U.S. stocks. Right? So that's a lot of companies. With these stock baskets, there are you know, 30 stocks, something along those lines, so much more concentrated. And they're focused on the outcomes of these individual companies. And when the portfolio managers are buying these, these uh, stocks, they're saying, OK, I think that the price of this company is going to appreciate because I think its earnings power is going to be much stronger than people think. Or I think that people have discounted or, or not taken into account the fact that it has these great assets 
on its balance sheet. They have some theory around that particular company and they will make adjustments. Now they're long-term investors. They like to um, fashion themselves after Warren Buffett who describes the best kind of investing as being an owner of a company, being kind of a stakeholder in a company rather than someone who's trading companies day in and day out. And that's how the team kind of fashions themselves. So they won't be churning through the portfolio. But you better believe that in an environment like 2020, that is akin to Nordstrom's half yearly sale. It is a wonderful environment, as painful as it feels. This is a time where these companies are coming down for reasons that don't necessarily relate to their underlying value, and it is a great time to be buying. So in a period like that, they might look a bit tactical as they change up the holdings to take advantage of some of these opportunities. What are our valuations today? Yeah. I mean, is the market overpriced, priced appropriately? Yeah. Is it a bargain shop? Something that, you know, see? So, question on how, what are the valuations um, of the market today? And so when we talk about valuations, we're saying how much are, how are, how are companies priced relative to their actual value? And often, or not often, but sometimes the prices are not actually related to their underlying value, their long-term value. So they can be overpriced relative to what their actual value is, or they could be underpriced relative to their actual value. And that depends a bit on the environment that you're in. So um, if the environment that you're in is very steady, um, the companies are very healthy, um, there's not much uncertainty in the market, then maybe the prices and the value are actually pretty well aligned. But in an environment like the one that we've been in really since COVID, um, it has been a really uncertain environment. So if you can recall, what was it in, tw in 2000, 2021, where, um, our uh, Federal Reserve was telling us that inflation was transitory, right? That was the prevailing wisdom at the time. Inflation is still something that we're contending with today, not very transitory. The Federal Reserve, the governors of the Federal Reserve are not dumb people, they're not dummies. Um, they were reflecting what I think was what most people were thinking. And it just shows how uncertain the times are today. There's a lot of things that are moving. And so when we have these periods of uncertainty, I think there's more possibility for prices and value to be a bit disconnected. From our view, when we look at the broad U.S. stock market, it doesn't look like it's screamingly attractive. It doesn't look like it's screamingly cheap. But when you think about the U.S. Um, stock market, there's actually a lot of different sectors underneath the U.S. stock market. So maybe when you aggregate it all up, you add it all up, maybe the U.S. stock market isn't super attractive. But that doesn't mean that there aren't great opportunities within the U.S. stock market. So if I were to point to a few of them, I'll, I'll talk about it in terms of economic sectors and describe to you the companies that are in them. If I look at something like um, communication services, we were talking about this today. Communication services is home to companies like Facebook or Meta. It's home to companies like Google or Alphabet, Disney, Netflix, a bunch of cable companies. When we look at those companies, those companies actually took a beating in 2020. I mean, or excuse me, 2022. When you look at what happened with Facebook, when you look at what happened with Netflix, um, concerns about streaming and that kind of thing, these companies just tanked. So from our perspective, that was actually a really good buying opportunity. And still, when we look at those companies today, we think they're okay, we think they're attractively priced, they're okay priced. Um, banks, <laughs> we all know what's happened with banks. We know what's happened with the bank runs, we know about Silicon Valley, maybe more than we'd like to know about Silicon Valley and its, its friends that have also suffered. Um, and that has meant that we've seen banks sell off in a way that we typically don't see them sell off. Banks are always the types of companies that are rooted in the trust of the depositors, right? And also the trust of the borrowers with banks. Um, so there is certainly uncertainty around how banks are gonna play out because trust isn't necessarily something that you can perfectly predict and that's what makes bank runs so dangerous. But the way that they have sell sold off makes us think that there is some opportunity here. And as we take a closer look at banks, one of the big risks that folks are concerned about on a go forward basis is commercial real estate and how much exposure, especially small banks have 
to commercial real estate. So what we do is when we take a look at banks, we start stress testing those commercial real estates. We ask ourselves, what if all of these loans defaulted? What would happen to these banks? What kind of earnings impact would there be? And we still think that even in a severely terrible <laughs> scenario, that some of these banks would be okay. And so that suggests to us, not that we push all of our portfolio into banks because there is a range of outcomes. We don't want to play the fool, but that we do have a little bit more exposure because this is kind of um, the type of opportunity that starts to emerge. Opportunities don't typically emerge when everyone's happy and everything feels great. You typically don't get a, a price disconnect. In a time like this, when people are tense, when there's concern about the fundamentals, that tends to be more of an opportunity. So communication services, banks are areas that are attractive to us. There are other areas like consumer staples, healthcare that tend to be a bit steadier, that could hold up better in a recession that we also have in our portfolios. So we're looking for good scenarios and bad scenarios and how these different assets are gonna behave relative to one another. And we do see some opportunities in US stocks. Sure. Marta, you'll be here. I'll be here. Yeah. Answer all your other ones. So, not to put you on a spot, being too precise, but my question is: Is when is the market going to go up and stay up? And <laughs> give me a range. Oh, yeah. Morning. Morning. Yeah. 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 That's and then we yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's super easy. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I, here's what I'll say. I think there's a lot of risk that isn't necessarily priced into the very broad market, right? So if we look at how markets have behaved, and I'm talking specifically about U.S. stocks, um, since October of last year, it has been a little, a little party in U.S. stocks. Um, there has been this thinking that inflation was on its way down, that interest rates, the Federal Reserve was going to pivot and stop kind of oppressing the economy the way it has. There was um, excitement about China reopening and what that could mean for the uh, global economy. So there was a lot of good news that people were getting excited about. Um, earnings have come in pretty strong. So concerns about recessions are maybe fading from people's minds. Um, and what I would argue is that I think there's room for disappointment if we're looking at very broad markets. And so I don't think that means you change your portfolio. I don't think that means that you get out of stocks. I think market timing is one of the worst things to do. It's pretty guaranteed to lose you money. But I do think it means that you shouldn't set your expectations for smooth sailing. You should expect some volatility in this particular market environment. And if you expect volatility, I think that will help you better manage if it comes about because you won't be so disappointed if things bounce around a little bit. But what I will say, since that doesn't seem happy news, what I will say is that valuations are much better than they were pre-2022. So if we're looking at five and 10 year periods of time, I think this isn't a bad time to be an investor. And I think over that longer term stretch, we're gonna do just fine with our equity portfolios. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. I'll also follow up by uh, with one thing is Marta was talking about banks and the kinds of earnings that they can expect to make and to, to kind of drive a point home in terms of Morningstar's investment philosophy. We talk a lot about the, the Buffett quote, price is what you pay, value is what you get. Mm. And so when we rate companies, it's really simply about the earnings that they're going to make in the future, mm -hmm. right? That's the value. Mm -hmm. The price of the market is what the S&P 500 closed at today. And that really has nothing to do with the actual value of a company. That's right. right? And so can you talk a little bit about like how we analyze a business in terms of what the future earnings are going to be and how that really has nothing to do with that's right. what the price is Yeah, today. that's right. So, so just to give you some kind of context on what we're doing when we're looking at stocks, and this is what our equity research team is doing, and this is what our portfolio managers and, and investment team analysts are doing. When we're looking at individual companies, the idea is that the earnings technically are what you as an owner of the company are entitled to. And technically a company can reinvest those earnings in new opportunities or the company could pay those earnings out to its investors as dividends. But the earnings is the proxy for the company value. Um, and so when we're doing analysis on a company, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, given these different factors, given the business lines that they have, the costs that they have, our expectation is that the earnings are gonna grow at this particular rate over time. And we can look at how the company's 
done historically. We can look at the factors that are at play today and actually forecast those earnings out over you know, many, many years. And then what we do is we, look, we take interest rates and we say, okay, what if I were to receive those earnings today? What would, what would they, they be worth today? And that gives us a value of the company. And then we can say, okay, the value of the company is, is X, but the price is trading at X minus two. So therefore, this is an opportunity. And that's the analysis that we're doing. And it means that uh, we're not necessarily making money on every day that we make an investment in this, in this stock, but it does mean that over the long run, we expect that there, that gap between the price and the value to close as the market kind of has wisdom about, about the, the company. Or vice versa, it might be a company that's selling for a price well above for what it's worth. That's right. And sometimes that's okay because you expect that company to grow. That's right. But other times it's simply selling at a price that's really unrealistic, right? That's right. That would be something that we wouldn't want. That's right. That's right. Great. Time to uh, trip her up. (laughs) (laughs) Or you could, oh, Rick? Yeah, what do you see happening with the Fed's and interest rates? Yeah. So we have been, so if you were to look at the start of the year, the Federal Reserve was actually, or excuse me, the market was actually pretty convinced that inflation was going to do an upside down V, that it was going to peak and come, or it had peaked, and it was going to come down perfectly to 2% and stay right there at 2%. Um, And that the Fed, despite its tough talk, was going to pivot. Um, And by pivoting, that would mean that it was um, no longer going to raise rates and at some point actually have to cut rates because the economy was going to go into a recession. Um, The market has been proven consistently wrong over the course of the year. In fact, market expectations have been moving more in line with what the Fed has been saying all along. One scenario that we're playing out in our minds and, and running a lot of analysis on is what happens if inflation, the, the long run inflation in the US is 2%, give or take. Um, what if inflation doesn't settle out at 2%? What if it settles out at 3 or 4%? What does this mean in terms of what interest rates would be relative to what they've been over the past decade? And what does it mean for how markets are gonna behave? Um, and it's our view that that scenario of a little bit higher inflation is not out of the question. In fact, we would argue that maybe the market isn't taking that possibility seriously enough. That doesn't mean it's gonna happen, but it does mean that it's within the range of probability. And if it's within the range of probability, maybe the Fed does pause at the June meeting, maybe it pauses for longer, but it's not necessarily going to cut rates unless we start to see really um, Uh, looser labor markets and looser inflation, broadly speaking. The Fed has, I think, surprised people with its resolve in this inflation fight, and it would be surprising to me if they capitulated right now when the economy still seems to be relatively healthy. They really don't want inflation to set in. So I I don't know if we can predict exactly what the Fed is going to do without having some expectation around inflation. Um, But I think the general view is that there will be a pause at the June meeting, followed by potentially a 25 basis point rise in the months to follow. And I don't think that's a a miscalculation. Um, We'll have to just see how it plays out. Either way, I don't know if it meaningfully changes how you invest. Yes. Technology, yes. 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 Yeah. Um, so the question is on technology. Um, having a difficult year last year, some tech names doing quite well this year. Um, in AI and what all that means. I wish I knew what AI means. Um, We actually just had what we call lunch and learn on on our investment team where we talked explicitly not about the investment prospects of AI, but just kind of the fundamental use of AI. Um, You know, in our view, technology, so communication services is home to some big tech names, um, but technology, when we think about some of these other companies, Microsoft and the like, those those are different companies. And it's our view that they're a little bit overpriced. That doesn't mean they're not phenomenal companies. Microsoft, its ability to reinvent itself, its ability to get into cloud computing, its continuous innovation is incredibly impressive. 
but that doesn't mean I necessarily want to buy it at today's prices. Now, there are other investors who might feel differently about uh, Microsoft. Maybe they're not so sensitive to the price. Maybe they are more optimistic about the earnings and they think it's not fully priced in. Um, so, you know, I could, I could see an argument for that. But broadly speaking, the tech universe broadly is not something that we're overly excited about. And the reaction to AI has been exuberance. I think exuberance is a dangerous thing. So while you know this, this, this could be some seismic shift and the market isn't getting ahead of itself and this is all very well priced, it does feel like there's room for some disappointment there. That doesn't mean that AI isn't a transformative technology, we wouldn't want exposure to it, but um, I don't know if we'd want to buy NVIDIA or any of those companies at the price points they are at today. One more question that might wrap everything up a little bit, and then we, we can all eat. We haven't uh, addressed the idea of uh, the possibility of a recession yet. That's right. Uh, whether it, it actually, whether it actually matters or not. Uh, recent data looks good, right? So yeah. Are we? We'll put you on the spot. Are we going to have a recession? And <laughs> it <laughs> You know, it's so, the, the question on recession is, is such an interesting one because um, there are so many signals that would suggest a recession is Im imminent. So there's, um, you know, the, the collection of leading indicators that are pointing south. There um, is the inverted yield curve, where, um, which means that um, typically you would have a yield curve, short-term bonds and long-term bonds, there'd be this positive slope to what they're paying off, and today it's inverted, meaning short-term bonds are ahead of long-term bonds, which means investors are concerned about the growth prospects for the U.S. economy. That tends to be a really big tell in terms of how a recession might play out. And I tend to be um, really concerned about risk. But no matter how we slice it, no matter what we're looking at, when we're looking at the actual individual companies, companies are actually pretty healthy. Their financial leverage isn't at extremes. Their earnings seem somewhat um, sustainable. When we just look at the last earnings cycle, a lot of companies beat expectations. Analysts are actually ramping back up their expectations for earnings. Um, the economy is handling this environment actually incredibly well. Consumers are weakened relative to a few years ago, but they're not um, and you know, they're not falling apart. Unemployment is really low, though that's a really lagging indicator that wouldn't be creeping up ahead of a recession. That would actually be part of the recession. Um, so I think the best guess, and of course any guess, again, has a range of outcomes around it, right? So this is just kind of the midpoint of a possibility. But our best guess is if there is a recession, it's not gonna be the kind of thing that's gonna have um, incredibly high unemployment and just a desolated economy. Our best guess is that a recession would be a bit of a soft landing. But if inflation continues to remain high, if the Federal Reserve continues to push on interest rates, because inflation is actually a very bad outcome. You do not want this to stick around for a decade. Um, so the Federal Reserve might have to cause some short-term pain to solve this longer-term problem. Um, maybe we could start to see a weakening of conditions. But right now, companies still seem okay. And I think that gives us some confidence that a recession wouldn't be a devastating event.